Well, welcome again to Rare Classic Cars. We have Mark back again by... He's um, back. He's back, that's right. By the way, I just realized we have, uh, we've had Wayne Cady, who is John Manoogian's manager, who was your manager. Yeah, I, right, uh, uh, John Manoogian was my first uh, uh, director when I hired into GM, my first experience at GM. So we've got like the whole GM yeah, lineage Yeah, it's here. a line, it's a lineage. It's, it's a certain, a line of procession. A line of procession. <laughs> so Mark is back and we have the 72 uh, Imperial here. This is Sid Mead's actual Imperial. And so this is a tribute to Sid Mead. So. Mark actually was... And I hope it's also a tribute to my getting you hooked up with this car because you bought it from Sid because I told him to Yes. Buy it. <laughs> yeah, so when Mark actually introduced... Mark was the one who knew Sid. I, I, being the finance guy, as the viewers know, I did not know Sid at all, nor would he probably generally like to socialize with me. But uh, Mark introduced me to him, and Sid was uh, looking to sell this car, and he and I had a conversation, and... It's one of those times where generally I like to negotiate, but I didn't negotiate at all. He offered a fair price, and I said, that sounds good. End of conversation. I stayed out of that part of the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was one of those things I didn't want to, didn't think that was appropriate to negotiate, especially he was, he was yeah. uh, asking a fair price. So this is a tribute uh, to Sid. So maybe just say a few words for the viewer about Well, it's him. not only a tribute to Sid because uh, it happens to be Sid, uh, Sid's birthday. So today he would have been 89 years old. Unfortunately, Sid passed away uh, in uh, December of uh, 2019. I'd known him for the better part of a um, couple of decades, actually. Um, and uh, we were really good friends through the classic car hobby. So Sid Mead uh, was probably, in my profession, if there is a, such a thing as fame or, or celebrity, he was probably one of the top ranking celebrities and famous people in my profession. And curiously enough, to the general public, he's a complete unknown, really, because he, he's doing something so, so he was doing something so specialized that while extremely well known and, and famous in the area of entertainment art and industrial design and automotive design, uh, of course, the general public didn't necessarily know about him, but they knew of his art and the things that he did. Like the movie Blade Runner, the same right design Tron. Uh, he worked on Aliens, Alien, Aliens, Star Trek, the motion picture. Uh, he worked for Disney. He he did an unbelievable amount of art. Where he actually Sid meets artwork is going back a little bit further uh, to the 1960s and 70s. It is truly his artwork that inspired the entire an entire generation of um, movie uh, production designers and and uh, movie makers and uh, especially films like Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, things like that were, were very, very much influenced by the aesthetic of Sid Mead that he created. I think you, uh, you best summed it up well at some point to me that that kind of is super industrial, steam pipe, sci-fi look was really... Well, he was of sort of one of... The, uh, he, he did something that other people had done before him, but he took this whole genre of futurism and illustrating sci-fi concepts or, or t um, concepts of uh, science fiction or coming impending technologies. He illustrated that in a style that was so perfected and so elevated. He had, he had an art uh, that inspired generations of designers and illustrators and game makers and people who went into the movies and, and, and designed sets mm. and that sort of thing. So, his, his importance in the field of entertainment art cannot be overstated. He truly was the giant. And everyone who went to art school, uh, including myself and many of my colleagues in the business, I mean, Sid Mead was revered because of his artwork. Uh, basically launched his independent career as an illustrator and artist extraordinaire by uh, doing commission work for U.S. Steel. Mm, that's right, yeah. So we'll intersperse some pictures of projections, that book that he did for you. Yeah, is yeah, pretty, yeah. It's pretty one, awesome. of my, one of my many treasured possessions that I have uh, from him or, or, or about him that he autographed uh, for me. Uh, um, a lot of designers in the business have a copy of one of his U.S. Steel books that are quite famous from the early 60s, very futuristic, very mid-century modern. Mm. He did the whole work. I mean, he, he produced the whole thing he did the layout and the graphics and of course he did all the illustrations and and the and the font uh, the typeface selection and all that stuff was uh, it's a complete work of of industrial and graphic design art that he did there mm -hmm. and, and US Steel used them for promotional purposes and that sort of thing and they've become rather treasured possessions now especially if they're autographed by Sid which <laughs> many of them are <laughs> yeah. well we should do a i mean i've 
I have previously featured this car, but I haven't been able to comment on anything relevant to the design. And I think to have Mark just talk about the vehicle and what it stood for in the context of the early mm -hmm. 70s. Because it's so, it's quite radical when you think of, you know, the 72 yeah, Sedan DeVille yeah. and the Lincoln. Maybe we'll, well, the fuselage design, uh, design language is interesting anyway because it was a pretty radical approach to purity and commitment to purity on Chrysler's part. And they, they had high hopes. They pinned very high hopes on these. I guess the fuselage design was fairly successful. They sold rather well initially. Um, and unfortunately, Chrysler has, had always had a very, very lucky hand in timing, it seems, because <laughs> right when they replaced these in 1974 was, of course, the OPEC oil embargo and the big, big, uh, the big uh, crisis of the early to mid-70s in terms of long fuel lines and people running away as fast as they could from large cars. So, And, and this is actually, mm. uh, this the 1973 Imperial, this is a 72. The 73 has some big bumper guards in the front and the rear, but the yeah, 73 is the longest. The car. It's essentially the mm. same. It was the longest production vehicle ever made, bigger than the 59 Lincoln, the Cadillac uh, Fleetwood. Production sedan, right? Production sedan, yeah, correct. Yeah, 235 yeah. inches long. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a technicality because the bumper guards sort of pushed it there, but some people say the late 50s uh, Continental, Lincoln Continentals yeah. and Lincolns were the biggest ones. Which had a bigger wheelbase. Those, I think, were 130 But plus then you, we have to say that these were probably the largest unibody cars ever made, along with those Lincolns and, Link and Lincoln Continentals. Right. These, that, I think it's a little bit of a toss-up between those. It is funny that some uh, of the longest cars ever made were unibodies, those, including this one. Yeah, which is not without its engineering challenges, <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take the camera off and walk around and we can talk mm. about some design elements then. All right, so let's do a walk around of this. And as Mark was saying, this was this came out in '69, along with the other fuselage cars for Chrysler. And, uh, maybe just explain a little bit to the viewers, Mark, about what that meant and how it was different. Well, Chrysler promoted it as a, an advanced way of body engineering, like an aircraft fuselage, which is where the term comes from. So it's this sing, symbol, a single smooth section, shoulderless. It doesn't have any discernible ledge here. It's a smooth continuous sweep that goes from uh, the bottom of the rocker sill into the roof. Uh, fairly flush glass, and we got the glass rolled down, but this was a trend that emerged in the second half of the 60s that this car took to an extreme, which was a very, very smooth, precise looking upper with the, with the glass up. We should probably demonstrate that in a minute to see how, how precise it looks when the windows are up. And it was supposed to emulate um, the strength and lightness and efficiency and modernism of an aircraft fuselage, and hence the the moniker, the label they attached to it. And, and it wasn't just advertising hype because it did have some advantages. One thing was that a shape like that, that doesn't have a big step on, on the belt line uh, level on, on the body, allows for a lot of shoulder room and a very, very spacious interior because um, the curvature of the glass uh, so close to the outer skin of the car, of course, gives you the opportunity to widen the interior mm. quite a bit. And the other, the other advantage that it has is that there could be some aerodynamic advantages realized with that because it's a smoother shape, which also refers then to the aviation or aircraft cliches. With you know, the speeds that are allowed in, in the US and were allowed then, uh, of course, that's a little bit of a stretch, but aerodynamically, it's, it's a pretty good foundation for flush uh, glass execution and, and low turbulence on the side. So there are some technical justifications for this design theme. What, what's amazing to me, too, is in the context of comparing it to the Cadillac and the Lincoln, which obviously were also long, big cars, but this car looks so much more physically imposing because it's visually tall as well. It is. I mean, it is. Look, it looks physically imposing because it is. It's, it's <laughs> mass, and it has certain design elements that enhance it. For instance, these vertical teardrop-shaped outer pods, the bladed fenders that are very reminiscent of Lincoln Continentals. Uh, this was a thing that, you know, with the peak molding that was very much... Um, uh, kicked off by Lincoln in 1961 and, and copied in various forms by many automakers. Um, and uh, uh, Chrysler um, uh, deploys it here on the Imperial line. And then you have these massive outer uh, lamp lenses, you know, with a turn signal and, uh, and parking lamps in these pods. Concealed headlights that was going out uh, in 1972 that was sort of a little late uh, faddish uh, feature that these still have. The concealed headlamps were a thing back in the late 60s. 
The uh, Grand Fury, the 72 Grand Fury still has them. Some of the other Chrysler products still hung on to them uh, when GM had long moved away from them, for instance, and Ford still had them on some, some products. They did, the Mercury yeah. and Lincolns. GM really didn't have yeah. any. I think the only Cadillac with hidden headlights was a 67 to 8 Eldorado. Uh, yes, but um, of course they were available on some Chevy products, and That's I mean right, they the were Capris, a fad in the late yeah. '60s. That was sort of uh, peak Riviera hidden headlight, had them, you know, exactly. Tornado. So, so GM actually had them before the '65 Riviera had them already. That's right. And uh, so GM sort of preceded the other guys. It was a very, very popular option, but of course it comes uh, with its own set of challenges. <laughs> Super cool, major, minor theme here of, with the rectangles. It gets replicated. Uh, oh, you like that when we were talking about that on the on the on the yeah, Lincoln see, Grill. I, right? I, yeah, I, it's a this is a very architectural and and very very restrained execution of grill texture. I think it was very fascinating, similar to what they did on the on your '72 Lincoln. Uh, I think John Manugian was talking about it. You know, it's a fashion business. So this is this is the fashion of the day was to um, do the major minor graphic shapes. You have the overall simple rectangular uh, loop bumper. Then you have a rectangular uh, shape with a smaller repetition of a similar element inside to give you some depth and some texture and some some interest. Um, this one, I would never want to have to clean that grill. <laughs> there aren't enough discarded toothbrushes on the planet to get into all those nooks and crannies and Fair clean enough. that out. It is kind of interesting, too, because this hood, you have this forehead, I guess I'll mm -hmm. call it, but it, you take almost a Lincoln Continental line and, and a shoulder that you pull yes, out. Yes, these are know. some form, um, form themes, some, some uh, form approaches that were quite familiar to all the big three automakers. This is very Cadillac, uh, late 60s Cadillac. This is the deck lid on, a, on an Eldorado. It is the deck lid. On it's the a, of, it's yeah. a very a boxy shape that gets pulled out of a lower shape and then creates these sort of filleted membraned raised platforms and it's actually very formal almost like a piece of granite that's been been shaped and it's supposed to give a uh, feeling of substance and and have an imposing uh, a character to it you don't know if it's a front end or a back end this could also be the back end of a car i've heard i've heard yeah. bill mitchell uh, had yeah. this one driving around the design yeah. center yeah. Uh, area backwards backwards because uh uh, I mean, but but it looks cool. It looks pretty cool, and the thing is, to be honest, uh, oftentimes rear end uh, motifs or, or trim try to emulate grill textures. If you look at Cadillacs from the late 50s uh, to 1960, 61, uh, not 61 so much, right? I would say the 1959 and 1960 Cadillac, the rear end coves on, around the bumper, um, or inside of the bumper, they emulate the grill. So it's actually a fairly often mm. used cliche to harmonize the front and the back end by using similar references. Interesting. So uh, this one definitely could be the rear end, could be a deck lid, but it's got some very beautiful, interesting um, layerings of, of moldings. I find the hood gap here very nicely integrated. The hood gap is usually pretty large in order mm. to manage the overslam, but I think the way they framed it with a secondary piece of bright work um, that's actually not overdone. It's quite it's quite subtle, and it it, it frames the uh, hood forms very nicely. It's it's very nicely done because it creates an interesting interplay between the shape of the car, the painted part of the car. Then there's a big hood gap that you can literally stick your finger in, which you need for the overslam when the hood comes down. And then you have the forms of the the loop bumper, and then the inserts for the grill, all in a very very nicely balanced uh, hierarchy of of what is you know, primary what is secondary. And then uh, a very, very simple and elegant integration of the, the lower valence. If you look at the um, formation here, it picks up the form of oh, the yeah. uh, license plate cut out, um, which is not something that, that was generally done. Usually that was disregarded. Nobody looks at that anyway. On this car, it's quite nicely integrated and very, very well thought out on, on, uh, on that level. That's a great point. I love on the... Uh the side profile here, the belt line just kind of gradually rises and then has yes, this. Yes, and terminates at the C pillar, which is a, an, in contrast to some of the other competitive vehicles that ran it all the way through or, or created a, a peak molding that ran all the way to the back. This one loops around here and then you pick up a molding here at the bottom of the vinyl top. But really the, the dominant motif is that it comes two thirds of the length of the car and, and completes the uh, DLO, the daylight opening, as we like to say in the business, or the, the window graphic. And this fuselage came out in 69 and imagine like this compared to the 69 Cadillac C-pillar, you know, the very 
especially on the, the yes. hoops, very formal, and this is much more. This is very sloping. sloped and uh, and very rakish. Uh, it's a very handsome, albeit massive, but simple enough <laughs> shape to have a very very clear and 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 uh, very uh, uncluttered uh, presence and message. It's a uh, it's a car that does quite a lot with very little, and if you, I mean, very little in terms of entertaining features or, or surface sculpture, it's very little of that, but whatever it does use is very effective, I think, in a way. It's, it's uh, certainly a massive vehicle, but it's very reduced in terms of the elements. So this makes for a very clean uh, and very um, almost understated rear end appearance with some interesting secondary features like the little angles, the little um, dihedral angles that come down in the bumper give it a little more interest and they lift, they take mass out of the middle so it looks even wider by not having a very tall looking center portion of the rear. Mm. And then they drop down to meet the outer extensions of the bumper and the rear quarter trim. There's some beautiful secondary surfaces that you discover when you look around this car. There's a lot of very elegant, simple filleting, meaning negative or concave filled shapes. You see that here on how the fender peak gets modeled into the rear deck. Very nice, very subtle, beautiful reflections. And that whole thing follows the car around, even in the tail lamps. If you look at the tail lamps, the way they are shaped, they are little oh, concave they are. filleted they are little, yes. It's hard to pick up on camera, but it's scooped it's out. Very, it's very not, beautiful. And you have you know, a, a repetition somewhat here with this feature in the bumper. Wow. You get all of this. So, so there's, there's a little motif <laughs> here that they used, and they, they really try to stick to um, the character of how they handle the surfaces and the details, which is quite interesting. I do love it. It's the largest car with the smallest rear fender skirt ever, too. <laughs> well, I'm glad <laughs> of it because it actually looks good on this car. It it's so discreet. Good. And it doesn't, it doesn't look, li look like it's taken too much of the wheel form away, which is the main drawback <laughs> of skirted fenders is it covers too much of the wheel. But yeah, it's, it's little details like this. So even how the secondary ledge that's in the bumper here, I just mentioned the dihedral as it comes around, you see that it has this elegant little fillet that continues into the lower body side character line. And it's all blended nicely. It's nothing is, nothing is abrupt or ends uh, without resolution. So it's nicely resolved. Nice uh, rear backup lamp integration too in the that's, middle there. Yeah, that's, that's another interesting thing. So they have the reflectors and there's, again, longer, lower, wider and taken mass away by, by uh, bringing that, that character line up that, that makes the bumper visually slimmer and, and enhances the width and, and uh, takes mass off. And then they have this reflector in a, an oval bezel and the middle piece here is the backup light. You barely notice it, but it's a pretty large backup light. When that comes on, uh, other drivers will notice that. And uh, <laughs> so it's a very, very elegant and, and uh, thoughtful integration of these as elements in the car. Now, it's, it's interesting, too, because the black perhaps helps the exterior remain understated and tasteful. But the interior in this car is gold, which is... What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not understated. It is several shades of gold, too. It is. It's kind of like a greenish gold. Uh, it's, uh, well, I mean, we have to, in all fairness, this car is over half a century old. And uh, the plastics used, I mean, any material used, the dyes and the pigments, they change over time. So you have different materials that age at different rates. And you see the armrests have a different hue than the door trim panels, which have a different different tone from the, from the garnish Chrysler trim. Corporation. Yes, you got to complain about that. I'm sure J.D. Power will like to hear about that. That's right. But um, they do. Yeah. Have, they have the head pillow in the back, which was unique to Imperial. Yeah, they had a that little re uh, rest, uh, uh, restful little pillow that's in, this, in the C pillar trim, which, uh, and it has a lavalier Yes, uh, lavalier's style, got the rocks. Uh, uh, handle, a grab handle here, which is actually quite neat. They, they actually make some kind of sense because they swing out of the way and they ergonomically not bad. They're, they're, instead of being fixed, they go with the, uh, the user, the, you know, so it's actually a nice uh, idea. And the, the dash theme here is you know, quite simple. I mean, In keeping with the rest of the car, very simple. Now, I always felt that the interior quality and the detailing of the fuselage cars on the inside wasn't as good as some of the outside ideas. I always thought that this was a fairly plain, both in the material appearance and the thematic execution, uh, a fairly plain approach. Um, this one, to me, would be just as at home in a Dodge or a Plymouth to a certain extent. Even the simulated, the the, simulated the wood veneer. from the vinoleum tree um, <laughs> looks 
exactly what it is, uh, stick on it plastic, is, so. I have a, for those who've been watching the channel, I have a 72 New Yorker as well. And this top pad is thicker, the bottom pad is thicker, but that's mm. kind of That's it. the only differentiation, yeah, yeah because uh, the Chrysler, of course, never had the volume in this segment to justify a huge investment. So they had to make, uh, you know, a lemonade out of lemons, and uh, they definitely had to stretch the dollar more than, than a Lincoln or, or especially a Cadillac would. And so they needed to take a lot of uh, existing parts and uh, existing tooling and, and doll that up a little bit, which is what they did here with a thicker instrument pad. You did get a full complement of gauges versus the Chrysler that just had the alternator gauge. You got this light that pops on that reminds you to fasten belts and lock your doors. Mm -hmm. stays on for about five seconds after you close them. That's the nice difference between Mopar and the rest of the industry. You still got gauges. That's I mean, true. Everybody else had switched to idiot lights, and they're idiotic for sure. And Chrysler hung on to a more or less, if not complete, at least some uh, array of gauges that inform the driver uh, when things are uh, not going the way they should. But, and a couple interesting controls. This is the radio fader here, the this, this style that you move back and forth if you want more front or rear speaker volume. The map light switch, this is the antenna if you want to raise the power antenna or lower it, you push push that button there. It does have the rim blow wheel that you pinch. And there you go. You can hear the horn honk. Tilt. Your neighbors are going to love you now. Well, they will. Oh, well. Tilt telescope wheel. Chrysler did have really nice uh, flood lighting at night on these. Yeah, that was a feature they pushed was the instrument lighting, um, indirect lighting, uh, which was nice. Oh, hard to see. Uh, nothing as elaborate as the 1960 panelescent Astrodome, but uh, Certainly uh, more interesting than some of the standard uh, instrument lighting that was uh, de rigueur in those days. Great color on this interior. And of course, uh, uh, we were talking about the Barcelona chairs on the uh, Regency. Great this is point. a true loose cushion design. This has loose added cushions top and bottom, not just here at the seat back. GM um, was really not big on having that bottom one be loose. Chrysler was though for many I years. I don't know why that would be because clearly the Chrysler uh, people were able to execute it without having abrasion and, and wear and tear uh, yeah. pull off the, those pillows and, and GM never did them on the cushion portion of the seat. So. Even to the point the 81 Imperial was the only year where they had the loose kind of box cushion mm -hmm. top and bottom, 82, this becomes part of the seat. It certainly is a very elegant seat. Um, I think from my uh, preferences I would have reduced the number of tufted buttons by <laughs> about a third to make it a little bit, a bit, little bit yeah, more modern, a little, little less there. western saloon and a little more contemporary but it is a very very elegant looking seat especially with the uh, the wrapped, uh, the low profile headrest with the uh, L shaped uh, form that was also evident in the uh, Continental Mark IV that we discussed a few weeks ago. Uh, again, a lot of these cliches pop up on various different automakers' uh, products. If there were a car that a visual futurist would drive, it's hard not to see, you know, why. Like why else? What what else could you pick? That would be yeah, more Sid absolutely loved this car. Incidentally, it, it's a car from Michigan. He bought this car in two thousand and four. I remember that. Uh, we were talking about it. It was a very low mileage car, and uh, now it's back in Michigan. And uh, he absolutely loved this car, and, and I remember many, many uh, joyful rides in the car and blasting down uh, the 210 freeway in Pasadena or going to dinner in it. And uh, yeah, he did, he did enjoy this car very much. And, and now it's a very high mileage car with, I think, 12,600 miles. Yeah, you on. really need to lay off. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you, Mark. I think that's a great. Uh, Great design tribute, and as you were saying, it's Sid's birthday, so happy birthday, Sid. Thanks again. I mean, it was Yes, happy birthday, Sid, wherever you are. And uh, it was a true privilege knowing you and uh, being, being part of uh, some of the things in, in your life that we did together, which is a lot of car shows, a lot of classic <laughs> car shows. That's how we met. Well, what a great story and great memories, great vehicle. Happy birthday, Sid. Thanks. And a great, uh, great pedigree for this car for sure, owner pedigree anyway. Absolutely. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, take care. Well, thanks for watching this tribute to Sid Mead and his 72 Imperial. Stay tuned for an epilogue about Sid's artwork. A link will be posted below once that is completed.